welcome to Listen Up Podcast with your host, Natasha Player. This week we're getting up close and personal with Alexandra Soutan. It gives me great pleasure in welcoming her. Welcome, <laughs> Alexandra, to Listen Up Podcast. It's great to have you on the show. How are you? Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> it's and very you? hot. I'm good, thank you. It's very hot at the moment. So um, yeah. we're uh, in this wonderful climate in the summer in the UK. So it's great to have you on the podcast. So I'd just like to start by introducing this series. This series is in partnership with Pavilion Dance Southwest. And I get the great opportunity to interview female choreographers and how they are navigating the current times and their creativity. I'm going to begin by, as we often start a conversation with a welcome. Usually it's a handshake, a hug, a ritual to welcome people into a space, a breath to feel present in the moment, a stretch to start our day. What does ritual mean to you and how does it feature in your life? Um, a ritual to me is something that you practice on a regular basis. And um, I think the first thing I always do in the morning when I wake up is say thank you nice. and to drink a glass of water. So those are the mm -hmm. first two things I do regardless of whatever I have to do in the day. I always give thanks and drink a glass of water. <laughs> it's really important, isn't it? I think that giving thanks, whether it's for the breath that we have starting the day or giving thanks to the people that have come before us in, and had led the path to creating and learning and what we take on and carry forward into the future. Exactly. I feel there is a sense of a warrior, a courageousness, a sense of grounded in your being, in your presence when I've been taking part in your workshops or seen you perform. Where does that originate from? Can you unpack that if you feel it or? Yes, I can, but I, I don't really think I, I'm, totally aware of it. I think it's something that comes in the um, legacy of the women I've met or have been, or who have been in my life. I think my mom is a very resilient woman and she has had many struggles in her life, you know, already from a young age, leaving South Africa to exile in Malawi and then Zimbabwe. I guess she's a resilient woman and she, I've always seen her fight and be strong and my grandmother from my dad's side also a village woman white village woman very you know grounded and and very uh, humble there was something about her and also different women like Germaine Akoni who is my mentor same thing who's you know who I've been very influenced by as well in my practice in my dancing she's my mama of dance so I've got different mothers or women around me who have been of great influence and I guess all of these spirits and even my ancestors who I don't know yeah. have are kind of guiding me and I guess are keeping me grounded and there's really something about being grounded and rooted I always share it in my practice mm -hmm. because I feel like if we are grounded we know where we are going and we can stand if we are derooted we are lost so mm -hmm. a sense of grounding gives us a sense of purpose and a sense of of knowing where we're going yeah. knowledge yeah that grounding is so important isn't it to navigate through life um yeah and just be staying present with it wonderful to hear that snippets of your mum's life um and how that's impacted in your and those women powerful women no wonder um <laughs> the presence that you create on stage um and in your workshops you know and empowering others other women to um, feel connected to their body and themselves and in the place and the space that they find, them in, find themselves in, in that present time. Sandra, <laughs> has COVID shifted your work and home life balance? <laughs> That's a big question. Yes, I guess like everyone, because let's, let's you know, I always say, oh gosh, I'm privileged in a way compared to others. I always have to, always have to be aware that this COVID is affecting people in a very different way. And I guess yeah. for all artists, it's just that, especially that I was touring a lot this last year, 
Yeah. So everything that I was doing was really on stage. So as you know, all theaters have closed. So yeah. it feels like my, it feels like 2020 got canceled. Really. Mm. That's what I kept saying. It felt like 2020 got canceled and it felt like I was back in my beginnings when mm. I didn't really know what was happening next month or, you know, everything was very right here, right now in the moment. Mm. Whereas now I had gotten to a place where I already know what 2020 looks like, 2021, 2022. So there's this sense of future that is there, but right with this, it's like, no, we are back at this different time. And, you know, in Africa, we, there's a time, we say the Western time and the African time. And the African time is day by day. And I guess the Caribbean time is also like that. Day by day. Every day is, a, is today is today. So I have had to shift my mindset to this idea that today is today. And tomorrow is tomorrow. So right now we have to live what's today because you don't know if tomorrow is going to happen. So that's, that's almost shifted my mindset. Even with projects now when people ask me for two. 2021 20, 22 I say yes but we never know <laughs> that's that's how yeah that's how it's shifted my mindset I guess but that's I've in, yeah. yeah that's interesting isn't it you know how we you take that analogy of the right here right now today is today and you have that experience and that knowledge to draw from to help you change your mindset because in the west we are very much planning 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 you know we do so many risk assessments that you know, just in case something changes, uh, how do we, you know, how do we adapt to that? Whereas this is very different territory. So at least we can draw from um, that day-to-day -day knowledge and how to adapt. You know. But at the same time, I guess the knowledge of risk assessment means that I'm always thinking of a plan B. And that's why, for example, all these online classes or online activities and creating other opportunities rather than just waiting for things to happen. So I guess there's a good in everything and a bad in everything, I guess. Definitely. It's really making us think differently and how being creative in other ways and embracing technology if we so wish. You know? The female features a lot in your movement and your storytelling narrative. I recently heard Nova Reed discussing crediting women for the work that they do, especially black women as this is often does not get recognized or credited. There also seems to be a thread through your work championing the black female narrative, whether that is through contemporary culture in your pieces. Um, I originally saw back in the South Bank, um, Word. Um, there's been many pieces that you've created that is very much empowering women. Um, to your recent work, Giant, and also your solo piece, Ceci n'est point noir, this is not black. To your most recent collaboration with Dear Winnie. Is this female perspective the main driving force of your work? And are there added enriching multi-layered perspectives that also drive your purpose? That's a very good question. Um, I guess the feminine, because I'm a woman, my work is yeah. definitely created coming from a female or feminine or women perspective because that's what I am um, but for example word is a piece about men ah. it's really a piece about the stereotypes and the headlines uh, given on the black men and especially on the knife you know knife violence uh, you know the crime and these really highly uh, publicized or um, first covers of black on black crime and mm, all of yeah. this stereotype on the young men because I have a son so he's been a lot of he's I've been inspired by I've been inspired to make work to be a voice also for him but because I work a lot with female dancers I guess it comes out as really female strong or heavy because there's a lot of women in my work and that was a purpose purposely done because when I used to dance um, with men I used to always say oh there's something quite equal when you dance because I have a strong people used to say I have a strong alpha kind of energy um, in my movement and I always had a sense that oh but for me it doesn't matter women men it's a power that we can all have so it was a mission for me to work 
more with the women and empower them to have mm. to be bold enough to to stand on stage strongly without apologies and without fear of being seen as angry or or boyish or what because whether you and when I work with men I always encourage them to find their their softness their their kind of more um vulnerable qualities because we all have that as humans so yes I work a lot with women because it was really a mission to empower women and especially brown women of you know all the spectrums and yes the work there's a really I guess there's an intersection, but at the center it's the feminine, but there's really an intersection with the idea of looking at topics that are not just about women, but men also, like giant, it's about the the, the perspective of another African looking at the genocide in Rwanda and thinking of what could we have done as neighboring countries, but also remembering that at the top, the giants of this world were at the top as well. They were leading and they were there and they forgotten about this country and this country was in a genocide for so long and we didn't know about it. So it's it's really, you know, it's my work is really looking at issues. But of course, because I work with women and I'm a woman, there's definitely a feminine perspective. But the subject is most definitely uh, universal and speaks to men and women, I guess. I yeah, hope. it's very social political, isn't it? You know, you really bring to the forefront the current issues that are going on internationally whether that's work that's um that's impacts reflectively on your doorstep in europe or going to what i would say the motherland you know um and seeing what's going on there and just raising that awareness more through movement it's very powerful Thanks. you just touched on um terminology and <laughs> terminology can be very pro problematic and it's it, it's a big discussion at the moment through the different circles um, you use the term brown skinned now dance is very much described as black dance or we have the term BAME black Asian minority ethnic <laughs> <Yeah. Sorry. laughs> or POC people of color so what are your thoughts on um, terminology and why do you use the word brown skinned well terminology are is really important for me first of all i'm just going to give an example um when i did my piece of cine panoir i i was really empowered to almost rename myself and i always say i'm an afropean uh, woman when i talk about my heritage because i am an afropean woman because i feel like the term terminology i've been given us are through the a gaze of other people and mm -hmm. especially white people i would say and all these bami terms who are the people giving those terms. We have to think about it. So I like to find or define my own terminology because I have an ownership of what I want to say or how I see things. I believe we are all people of colors. White people are not white, they're pink or they are yellow or they're beige or whatever. We are brown, so we are color. We're different shades of brown. You are brown, you're a lighter brown, a golden brown, I'm a chocolate brown, you know? So that's why I prefer using the word brown also because black if you look in the dictionary it's always associated to something that is negative and i think we need to uh, decolonize our mindset and ourselves from all these words that have been placed there to give a sense of hierarchy to all of us as humankind and brown i feel like it's a color and white i i mean you know we say white because we've been told it's white but all of my white friends are not the same white and they're not white. I guess white, you know, I've studied fine arts. White, white is white and black is black and actually they're neutral. They're not really colors. So that's why I like to use the term brown because I feel that that's what I look like. I'm not black, I'm brown. And ironically, I'm Afropean because my dad's of, you know, is Belgium white and my mom is South African. So it's really important for me to own up to those terminologies rather than let people name continuously name us i guess we have we have to take that freedom to name ourselves as and i don't discriminate the idea of people wanting to say black but i i think we could be more specific black dance is too white african dance but even african is white mm. west african still that is white we can be a bit more specific mm. if we want yeah
Yeah, I think it's really honing down, isn't it? Um, asking individuals what they want to be called, you know, of how they describe themselves, um, and then really taking the time to unpack or just to even say the word in full. <laughs> You know, yes. <laughs> babe doesn't really mean anything, you know, at least go black, Asian, minority, ethnic. Even all of that is problematic, you know, minority, ethnic. Uh, we are not minority. Thank you for saying that. I'm glad. <laughs> we are not a minority. No, exactly. So what's really interesting is that um, you can draw from different cultural perspectives um, from your heritage. But also, um, I'm interested, you work on a global perspective as well. Um, so touching with the African continent, how do you think um, people are feeling more connected to the African continent now that they've gone from COVID-19 and also the impact of Black Lives Matter? So how do you think people and humans are feeling more connected or not? You know? it, this is really a, this is a big question. Um, people connected to Africa? I don't know because... Sometimes I feel like Africa is, is seen as this uh, utopic kind of uh, place. There's this utop mm. utopic or imaginary place. And I love all the artists who are embracing Africa, such as, you know, Beyonce and even like the Black Panther movie. But in reality, I don't feel it's the right, you know, it's it's beautiful, I guess, but it's not the right image. It gives us this utopic feel like Africa is this land of you know and yes Africa is this land of a lot of opportunities but at the same time it's this land that is being still uh, is not really independent um, it's still under you know governance of the west and Africans are really like cats they fall back on their feet and they survive mm -hmm. and that's what I, I, I want us to embrace and I think as people of the diaspora or Caribbean or African-American or Black American, however, we really need to unite in a way that is more, um, I guess, honest and real rather than just seeing Africa there and then, wow, and this is, you know, I think we really, and it's the same for people in Africa. I think we Africans also need to be more open to the fact that someone who's coming from Europe, who's from Af of an African descent may want to explore. And I think we have to, they have to also be more welcoming in, in, that because there's you know the when I used to come in the beginning in in Senegal I would be called white you know and I find that quite ironic that I'm called white or European when I'm coming to Africa and then when I'm here I'm seen as an African or I'm seen as a black or I'm seen mm. so I think there's a work for us to find ways of embracing each other and being honest and real with each other and really I guess you have to travel to Africa to see what Africa really is mm. because seeing just queens and kingdoms and all the parading and the gold and the it's there is a, a bit of that but it's not just that you yeah. know so i guess it's like yes i love the fact that there's an attention on africa but it can be very unhealthy and very coming from a capital capitalistic mindset which mm -hmm. is something that i don't really uh, find in find um useful for africa and for the others because going to africa every year i realize that africa is getting really built uh for kind of a western comfort now okay and it's in a way losing a little bit it's starting to lose a little bit of its groundness and heritage and mm. i guess we have to fight for that especially the children especially the children on the outside they have to also fight for this because it's our if it's your land fight for it if it's somewhere you believe that your ancestors are fight for it fight for it to remain and fight for you to be able to be there and feel safe that's what i would say we're in the african continent we're in west africa senegal we could not meet without discussing germaine Ekonye. the impact <laughs> of her work and your role as an ambassador on your life please tell us more about germaine and your your relationship um Germaine Lacony is, is, you know, is the mother of dance to many of her children, I would say. And I feel, you know, because saying, oh, she's just my mother would be a bit selfish because she has her biological children. But I, I guess I'm one of her children. And she's a powerful woman, very inspiring. And 
I guess from the first time I went to Senegal 10 years ago to study uh, with her and many other teachers, I was really fascinated by everything she had done. It was almost like seeing a vision of something that I wanted for myself at her age. So it felt really like an, uh, an inspiration because when I arrived there, I thought, this is my dream. This is what I've always dreamed of. This is the thing that I've visualized uh, in my subconscious dream as a, as a younger uh, child. And I'm seeing this woman realizing it. And I think that was the first instant I thought, wow, this is meant to be. And then doing her class, I realized that I was already in, in, a, in that path because I was already working with... Um, with movements that were Afrocentric and that in a way, because I've also, you know, uh, been privileged to also learn other forms, Western forms, I was able to, in, it was in a way enriching my vocabulary. But with Germaine, there was something with her that she always encouraged. It was this idea of always looking at where you're coming from and understanding and trying to research. And I guess, she really encouraged me to do that. She encouraged me to, to actually almost let go of ballet and the, this idea of a contemporary vernacular that is only from the West. Mm. But the idea that what we have is enough and mm. what we have is good enough to make work and that we can work with our vocabularies. And because I was blessed to meet 20, 40 people from 24 different countries in Africa, which was the first time for me, I was able to exchange so much and learn and see so much, so many movement and think, oh my gosh, we are so, we are full of, of creativity, full of movement, full of ideas. So if we work from there, we can create so much more. So that was definitely one big inspiration. It was this idea that creating a contemporary movement from our own, um, Afrocentric or Afri African traditional forms, and that was that was like my starting point. And Germaine, I think she, you know, not I think, but what from what I've observed, is really championing African dancers, dancers of the diaspora first and formally to you know, and that's why she created her school to train them, to give them knowledge, to educate them in the world and in a way that is African but also global to give them the opportunity to be artists, to be recognized. That was her first and main goal. And of course, welcoming others to also influence them mm. and exchange with them so that the others get, you know, also receive and exchange and go back in their countries fulfilled and nourished. So I thought there was something so motherly and so, um, yeah, so motherly, so caring, but at the same time, so strict, which I also mm. respected because there was something about this idea of dancing with joy and freedom, but f still with discipline. German mm. has been such an influence to all of us. And um, yeah. through the work she's done, she, you know, the sacrifice she's made to create her school um, mm. through her being a black you know, and I'll say black because it's the universal word, but brown, but not even that African woman, um, ambassador. And I feel she doesn't even get enough recognition for what she's doing, but she'll be definitely always, she'll always have a place in history. And, mm -hmm. and I guess it's so inspiring because I know that's what I want. I definitely want to get to that. And my relationship with her is beautiful because it's grown. She's learned to trust me. She's learned to, to, you know, to give me the opportunity to have a voice, to also influence her, as she say. We all inspire her. So she said that I've inspired her as well. So I feel very honored and privileged for that. So, yes, she's just my, my mother of dance. And I even say to my mother that I have also another mother of dance. You know, she's the same age as my mother. And both of them are very inspiring in my life right now. Yes. <laughs> um, you run, you say that you've inspired her. You run a, a training course yourself, don't you, at her school? Is that correct? Yeah. And then you um, invite artists from around the world. Yeah. Could you just talk to me a little bit about that? Um, yeah, the context of it. Yes. Yeah, so um, I've been regularly invited to teach at Ecole des Sables. Um, for their programs, but I also wanted 
to create a program called Dance Afrique Experimental Flow, which is an international workshop. And it happens for two weeks. And the reason I wanted to create this workshop it was to attract more dancers who are practicing street dance forms, club styles, forms that are called so-called urban forms. I would say that, you know, from hip hop to house, to locking, to breaking, to contemporary, to jazz. So form that are, you know, um, derived from the from Africa and its diaspora and the Caribbean forms. I really wanted to get this kind, these kinds of um, these kinds of artists at the school because I felt that it attracts more people who are from a contemporary dance background or traditional dance, and I really wanted to see that you know bring more diaspora. I really feel like this space is so fulfilling for the diaspora. It's so fulfilling for Black Americans, people in the mm-hmm. Caribbean. It's like coming home and having a, a safe space to be you and directed by, you know, led by myself who've had that experience. And I feel like I wanted to give back that experience that I've had going there mm-hmm. and giving it back to dancers who don't always maybe go into those trainings or feel like, oh, it's, as accessible to them. So I really wa- wanted to open um, an opportunity for other um, dancers. And Germain was really happy. I remember the first edition because the majority of the dancers are brown skin. And in a way, it, it's purposely done. And it's not in, when I say purposely done, I wouldn't say that I discriminate, but it's really about first and foremostly bringing dancers from the diaspora to come to Africa, to exchange with Africans. Yeah. And if you are not from the diaspora, you are practicing these forms and you have a strong interest in these forms. Mm. So then, yes, so that's why, so it was beautiful. It was the first time in an international workshop. We saw that even Germain was like, even in, in their international workshop, the balance is not so, and I was so proud because it's thinking of, it's amazing for also Africans to see, to meet and exchange with others who may look more like them and see how we can have a conversation but it's also so different because we are all so different so it's very it was for me it's very powerful to be able to 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 bring that 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 workshop yeah is that running 2021 hopefully yeah yes it's i waited a little bit to announce it i just announced it this month because i normally i announce it a year in advance but because of the situation i thought it's so ungraceful to announce it whilst we are all trying to figure out what's happening with our life. But because now, I guess even though it's still uncertain, there's a little bit more, in a way there's things opening up. There's, I guess it gives more perspective and it's in, it's in the near future, but it means that you can prepare for it. And eventually, if anything happens, we can still cancel and that's okay. But at least it's there. In the, it's in the planning. Yeah. It's so out yes, in the universe. Happening. Great, great. Yes. And so then what is next for you, Alexandra? Um, I know you're saying it's uncertain, but your different performances that you have, are they still available for touring or what else have you got that you're looking into? Or maybe not, and that's okay. You know, it's okay to pause, isn't it, I think, at this time? Yes, I guess we've had a long enough, I've had a kind of long enough pause, but um, Dear Winnie, the piece that I perform in and I, choreographed uh four because it's a theater piece and was directed by junior tumbeni and his collective cesar um and i i act as a choreographer and one of the performers in it it's it's won um, a selection prize in belgium and holland for the most i think striking or the strongest works that have been presented uh, in 2019 so because of that, normally we are scheduled to perform in beginning of September in Brussels and Amsterdam and Antwerp. The Antwerp one has been now a bit on hold because of what's been happening in Antwerp. But we are supposed to start rehearsals in two weeks and perform it about four or five times. So that's already great. I'm also going to be teaching uh, in the Contemporary Dance School Parts in Brussels. Um, so I'll be teaching there uh, with the new cohort of dancers. Mm-hmm. 
And then I guess what's next is planning. You know, I'm supposed to start my um, artistic directorship with a national youth dance company. So we'll see how that goes and how we can begin that eventually. I really feel sorry for the current director because, yeah, so many things have happened. But let's see how it, it, it continues. And I guess the work that was booked and planning to tour is happening, but it's been postponed and pushed back. So, yes, still doing my thing. There are workshops also online that are going to be happening. And, yes, planning the future, even though I'm always on the today's today. <laughs> That's a very good way to be. You know, um, but it helps to plan as well, doesn't it? Because then it knows where we are. Yeah. So we're coming to the end of our podcast conversation. Is there any last words that you'd like to share with the listeners? As usual, there's something I say in my class. If you go wrong, go wrong and strong. And I guess that's a little bit with everything we do. We shouldn't be scared to try to go wrong and to f- fall back and start again and do it. And especially with these times, I guess we shouldn't be afraid to to go wrong. We should just believe that we can just do what we want to do. And if there's something you thought you could, you, you didn't have time to do, this is the time to try it because you have more time in your hands to try something new. And as artists and dancers and people in the arts, we also have to open our minds to to having always a plan B because our our um, industry is, is quite fragile but we have to support each other and ourselves that's it <laughs> thank you thank you so much for your time and coming on listen up podcast we've thank been you. getting up close and personal with alexandra Sutem, and uh, i look forward to interviewing her in the future thank I'm you so signing much. off for now subscribe down below We would love to hear your comments to find out what takeaways and golden nuggets that you've taken from the podcast um, and insights that you've gained. I look forward for you to tune in and listen up more with Up Close and Personal on the next series. Bye for now. Welcome to Listen Up Podcast with your host, Natasha Player. This week, we are getting up close and personal with choreographer Alexandra Soutem. This is a series of podcasts in partnership with Pavilion Dance Southwest, who are sponsoring the interviews of three female choreographers, and we explore how they are navigating the current times and their creativity. Here is a short bio of Alexandra's career to date. Alexandra founded Vogue Hub Dance in 2007 and has progressively built a reputation for creating thought-provoking and visually striking performances. Her creativity is triggered by issues that address and reflect social, political and economic circumstances using movement, voice and music. She shares stories that induce conversation. Alexandra's aesthetic sits within contemporary dance but eloquently combines a range of genres from traditional Pan-African to social and so-called urban dances, creating a distinct and recognisable language that is uniquely her own. Past company productions include Ceci Nepois Noir, Tamps Mort, Word, So We Too, A Tonic Sun and Quenda Quenda, which have toured around the UK and to over nine countries. Her current works include Giant and Boy Breaking Glass, which performed at Sadler's Wells for their 20th anniversary recognings. Other choreographic commissions include work by Studio Wayne McGregor, Phoenix Dance, Random Acts, Channel 4 and much more. Alexandra is also the guest artistic director for the National Youth Dance Company, for 2020-2021, creating new work that will tour the UK.